theme this morning is, I think, part of this series that you've been looking at for a while, uh, on the Apostle Paul, Saved to Serve. And today our focus is going to be on Paul the Martyr. So, big thank you for giving me the easy topic to preach on today. But even though our, our focus is not going to be on literal, physical martyrdom, many of us probably in our context will never face that, I don't think it would be right to begin by not acknowledging the reality that martyrdom still exists in our world today. I've got a friend who works for the Christian Charity Release International. They work with the persecuted church right across the world. And I gave him a wee text to tell him that I was coming here. And I asked him, is there any one thing that we should be praying for with regards to modern-day martyrdoms and persecution in the world today? And he said, the nation that we should really be thinking about just now and praying for is Nigeria. By far the most people die for their faith just now in the nation of Nigeria. He told me that in 2022, reports indicate that extremists killed more than 6,000 people and destroyed 17 villages. Now, I don't know how many Christians you know, but 6,000 Christians in one, that's one year, 17 villages, presumably Christian villages, destroyed. Just pause for a second and take that in. Before we think about martyrdom in our context today or how we die to ourselves daily, think about that statistic for a second. I don't know about you, but I need, I need God to break my heart for stuff like that. Because I can get so cozy and comfortable in the West, and I can think, oh, that's over there. I'll never have to face that. But I long for God to break my heart. So I don't just hear things like that, but I hear and I care. I hear and I'm prompted to pray. I hear and I'm maybe even prompted to give in any way that I can. And so if it's okay, before we consider Paul the martyr for us in a nice cozy context of Glasgow, I'd like just to stop, pause, and to pray for the nation of Nigeria just now. Let's do that. Lord, before we get to considering this theme today in our context here, our quite comfortable context here in the West, Lord, we just take a moment to stop. And Lord, to pray for those right now in Nigeria and other places, but particularly Nigeria, that are living in fear of their lives because they follow you. Lord, firstly, we do want to ask that you would intervene, that you would break in in power, that you would bring safety, that you would bring justice, Lord, in that nation. We pray for stable government to rise up in Nigeria. Lord, for every single person right now who is living in fear, we ask even more that their faith would rise. Lord, that despite what they face in their daily lives, they would have deeper knowledge and deeper revelation of you, Jesus Christ. And Lord, that their faith would be so strong and would shine out in such a way that actually what we would see happening is more and more of these persecutors, these extremists, would turn to Jesus Christ. And we'd acknowledge him as Savior and Lord. And we would see that nation completely transformed, we pray. Lord, it's easy just to pray just now. Lord, we ask that you would help us to keep on praying. Prompt us to be a people that pray for situations like this. Not just to read about it in the papers or in the news or whatever it is, and then not pray, but to keep on praying for these situations. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start with some scripture reading today from the book of 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. It might be on the screen. I hope it's on the screen. Is it on the screen? Yeah, it is on the screen. Amazing. Let me read these words from the book of 2 Timothy. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me in that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now the tradition is that um, the Apostle Paul was indeed killed for his faith. He was beheaded, according to tradition, in Rome around 64 AD, which is probably the year after, or maybe even the same year as he wrote this final letter to Timothy. So in some ways, this is his final words that we read from this morning. So Paul 
by all accounts, was somebody who was killed for his faith. However, our focus today is more going to be on how Paul lived his earthly life. As I was thinking about the theme of martyrdom in the last couple of weeks, I read again a little bit from the, the famous book, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Very good book. And he, of course, was somebody who was killed for his faith. But he wrote some really amazing things about discipleship and what it means for us as Christians to live for Christ every day of our lives. One of the things that Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote was this. When Christ calls someone, he bids them come and die I wonder <laughs> when you first decided to put your trust in Jesus, when you first started coming to church, if that's how the gospel message was presented to you. When Christ calls someone, he bids them come and die. And I start with that because I think the Apostle Paul, for, for all the ways that he was somebody who was flawed, he really did live up to this statement. When we look at his life, we see someone who died to himself daily, someone who was pleased to take up his cross and follow Christ in his earthly life. And in that reading that we read, there's just really one small phrase that I'd like us to focus in on today. And that is the phrase that starts, that was there in the very beginning, verse 6 that we read from, where Paul talks about being poured out like a drink offering being poured out like a drink offering. Now, this was a phrase that Paul used more than once. He also used it in the book of Philippians as well, chapter 2, being poured out like a drink offering. If you don't know what a drink offering was, then you're in good company because I had to kind of do a bit of research as well to find out what a drink offering actually was. But drink offerings were often things like wine or other strong fermented drinks. That what would happen is in the, the sacrificial system in the temple, you would have your, your grain or whatever it is or your, your animal that was to be sacrificed and then you would pour around that sacrifice a drink offering. So it was almost like you were presenting food offering to God but also a drink offering as well. So what Paul is saying here is that his life was poured out, was to be poured out as a sacrifice, as an offering to God. And so today I want to really examine and think about how did Paul pour himself out that could be a challenge to us today in our quite comfortable context here in Glasgow and Scotland. So the first thing I'd like us to, the first kind of area I'd like us to think about is how Paul was willing to pour out his reputation. I did think about having a kind of glass today and doing that and pouring it out in front of you, but I thought that's just going to be too far <laughs> on a stage. I don't want to get it all wet and that kind of thing. But Paul was willing to pour out his reputation, his social standing. Let me read these words from Philippians chapter 3. Should be on the screen as well, I think. Hopefully. Chapter, I'll read in from verse uh, 4. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh... I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Now we know a little bit of the backgrounds of some of the other apostles. Not all of them, but we know a little bit of the backgrounds of some of the other ones. Peter, Andrew, James and John were all fishermen. So they were quite ordinary in their background. They were probably in many ways quite obscure, maybe even people who were living in some kind of poverty. And then we have Levi, who we know a little bit about his background as well. Now he was someone who was a tax collector, so he was a collaborator, in some ways a traitor, who had collaborated with the Roman government. And therefore he would have been held in very low regard by the society around about him. He had a poor standing. And so for all of these other apostles, 
Leaving their old way of life was probably very little in terms of hardship. However, the Apostle Paul was very different. He lists in this verse that we read from there, he lists his previous credentials. I don't know if you ever watched like that program television, Who Do You Think You Are? This is Paul's version of first century, Who Do You Think You Are? Ancestry was a real source of pride in those days. And which tribe, you could trace your tribe back as well in those days. You could trace right back to which tribe you belong to. And so Paul mentions here by name Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. I'm reading Harry Potter just now to my children. And they're obsessed with like the sorting hat and the, the houses and all that kind of stuff. Benjamin would probably have been like the Gryffindor of tribes. It's like the kind of fancy one. It's the distinguished one that everyone would have wanted to be part of. That's because it had, it had Jerusalem within its boundaries, for one. It was the tribe that gave Israel its first king. It wasn't a particularly good king, but nonetheless it had that prestige for providing the king's soul to Israel. Not only that, though, it was the faithful tribe. It was the tribe that aligned with Judah when Israel divided into two kingdoms, northern kingdom, Israel, southern kingdom, Judah. It was the faithful tribe, Benjamin. Paul points out that this was his tribe. Paul also says something about the particular sect of Judaism that he belonged to, that's Phariseeism. Now, we look at the Pharisees now, and we look at them with our kind of our worldview today, and all that we know of the Bible, and the Pharisees are the bad guys. They're the ones that nobody wants to be. They're, they're like, this, if I'm going to Harry Potter thing again, they're the slithering of the biblical world. But actually, Pharisees of the time, the Pharisees would have been the elite people of the time. They wouldn't actually have been a particularly high amount of Pharisees. They would have been quite a small amount of Pharisees. We have this kind of picture in the Bible that Pharisees were on every single street corner. And uh, you know, every, every five minutes, Jesus was bumping into Pharisees and that kind of thing. Actually, there were quite a small number of Pharisees at this time. They were an elite group. And they were known for their scrupulous devotion to God and for their devotion to the Scriptures as well, their knowledge of the Scriptures. Now, I don't know how much status and social standing means to you. I have to confess that sometimes status and how I'm regarded socially means more to me than perhaps it should. But here's what Paul was willing to do. He was willing to forfeit all of his religious heritage, all of his good standing, everything for Jesus Christ. All of his reputation would have been completely in tatters when he converted to Christ. And you know what, Paul? He could have saved a little bit for himself. He could easily have saved a bit of the old reputation, the old life, the old elitism for himself. There were plenty of people back then who tried to keep a little bit of both. In fact, the people that Paul's writing to when he writes these words here in Philippians chapter 3 are a group who are called the Judaizers. And what they did, they were this group who would go into, they, would, they infiltrated the, the first century church, the early church, and as well as, I guess, being people that held to Christ, they also said that as well as holding to Christ, yeah, Jesus is great, all that kind of thing, but as well as that, you've got to keep the old laws. You've got to keep all the same old laws that we've always had to keep for many, many years. And men, you've got to be circumcised. And what they were trying to do, these Judaizers, is they were trying to create two tiers of Christianity. They were trying to create the, the elite, the people who still aligned with Judaism, and the people who still had that little bit of prestige in their life that they wanted to hold on to, and this separate rung, the Gentiles and everyone else who had come to faith not from a background of what they had in terms of Judaism. In other words, they wanted to keep a little bit of the legalism and the elitism, mix it in with new life in Jesus Christ. When Paul is writing these words here, he is speaking against these people. And if you look at the book of Colossians, that's what Paul is pretty much doing in the book of Colossians. You get the picture that he's speaking to groups of people who have come into the church and have tried to sow disharmony among the early Christians by making them 
stick to other laws and ways of doing things that no longer were part of new life in Christ. Paul poured out every single bit of his status and his reputation so that he could be 100% given over to Christ. As I think about that, I wonder if the same could be said about me. Another thing that Paul did in terms of pouring his life out was he was someone who was willing to really embrace suffering for the gospel. Now, it's easy to think about the Apostle Paul in terms of the victorious Christian life that he had. It's easy to almost paint Paul sometimes as this super Christian. And we can sometimes talk about Paul in ways that further that view. But you know what? As much as Paul broke out of prison, as much as he had times where he broke out with singing and the chains snapped and all those kind of things, he also languished in prison for much of his life. He spent much of his later life and wrote much of his later letters under house arrest. As much as we can focus about the fact that Paul healed other people, he even brought someone back from the dead, he himself had a thorn in his flesh. We read about in 2 Corinthians. Some, we don't know what it was, but some physical health problem that even though he longed to be taken away, God responded and said, my grace is sufficient for you. And you know, as much as Paul saw many, many people come to faith, as much as he saw the gospel expand into brand new territories and places, he experienced countless floggings and other forms of persecution to match all of that. In fact, when he speaks about being an apostle or a minister who took the gospel into new places, you could almost be forgiven for thinking that he didn't really enjoy his job that much. Let's read these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. This is him describing the experience of himself and his colleagues, if you like, the fellow apostles. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. This is the Apostle Paul describing himself here as vulnerable and fragile. Even though they have this amazing message, this treasure that they take to new places with them, that they present to people, Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, they themselves are jars of clay. Now, it's easy to think of the big pots you get for your shrubs out of B&Q, those big, massive clay terracotta pots. This was tiny, fragile pots that would be easily broken and smashed. If you were to translate these words into a a very concise, modern-day translation, you would say that Paul would say this, we are just hanging on. We're just hanging on. You get the sense here that Paul is mentally, emotionally, and spiritually drained. Sometimes we don't talk about these things enough in church. He says, hey, this can be the reality for us as we follow after God. I don't know how you're feeling this morning. I would imagine there are probably some people in this room who are feeling mentally, emotionally, maybe even spiritually drained as we turn up to worship God together. In terms of my own testimony, I've had uh, quite a lot of health struggles, and pretty much all of them since I decided that I was going to begin full-time vocational ministry. About 11 years ago, I was diagnosed with a type of cancer called lymphoma, and you might have heard of that. It's a bit like leukemia. And I was, up to that point in my life, I'd had literally no health problems at all, and I thought I was invincible. I was fit. I was active. Everything was going well. I never understood anyone who had 
mental health problems as well. I would always think people just need to pull their socks up. I never, I never understood post-viral issues as well. I always thought, post-viral problems, what's that all about? But essentially what I had before I had cancer was a virus, a really bad virus that I was in hospital with, and that virus has never left my body to this day. And it caused a type of cancer called lymphoma. And then after that, in the years to come, after I went through the treatment for lymphoma, I also started to struggle with some of my mental health as well. Now again, before that, I would never have understood what it meant to struggle with mental health. And you know, I've asked God so many times, just like the Apostle Paul, to take these things away. I've went to healing meetings. I've had numerous people pray for me. I've pleaded with God, please, you know, help me to be a bit less fragile, God. Help me to feel stronger. Help me to feel more healthy. But, you know, more often than not, I hear the same thing back as the Apostle Paul did. I hear the words, my grace is sufficient. Or sometimes I hear those words from James chapter 1 that some of us will probably know. But it says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because in those trials, you know that your faith, your perseverance is going to grow. What happens is sometimes we get used, as God's people, to expecting the fullness of heaven in this life. And we forget that it's only when we'll meet with Jesus face to face that we will experience perfection. Where every tear will be wiped away, as it says in Revelation, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things will have passed away and the new order will be there to stay. Now hear this right. This is not to say that there's not massive transformation in our life when we follow Christ. It isn't to say that life is just one big difficulty and you're going to walk around for the rest of your life struggling, being fragile, that's absolutely not what I'm saying today. As much as I've had challenges in physical and mental health, I wouldn't swap any of them. I wouldn't swap the fact that I was diagnosed with cancer. I wouldn't swap the fact that I've had mental health struggles in my life. Because in it all, what God does is he redeems, he restores, he heals not always in the way that we want, but he always brings about transformation. And that has been my experience. In all of this, I've had to become a lot more dependent upon God. My prayer life has no doubt grown. I talk to God much more conversationally now when I'm, when I'm struggling, when I'm feeling like I'm having a tough week. I talk to God more than I would have ever, ever spoken to Him before. I'm dependent, I'm reliant on Him in a way that I never knew how to be before. Perhaps even more than that, I've learned empathy for the community that I am now in. I don't know if you know much about Parkhead, but when I say the words Parkhead in Glasgow, you're probably not thinking of some thriving met metropolis with lovely coffee shops and nice parks and all that kind of thing. You're probably thinking of Parkhead as the community that it is. It's a community that struggles. It has some of the worst statistics in terms of addiction, drug deaths, violence, probably in Glasgow. And here I am ministering in this community. Now, if I had ministered, if I went into ministering in a community like this without suffering, I would have had not a scooby-doo. I would have lasted a week, probably, if even. Because in Parkhead, the reality is that so many people, you might even say most people, are struggling in some way. Many people are struggling with their physical health. Many people are struggling with their mental health, their emotional health, their family life. So for me... To be someone who can walk up to them and when I speak to them in the street or I speak to them in the church and say, listen, I understand a bit of what you are feeling just now. I might look different from you. I might wear brogues and a check shot, but I understand something of what you're going through just now. My life might not have been exactly like what you, your life has been like, what your upbringing has been like, but I get a bit of it. God has, in all of this stuff that I've went through, the suffering and in some ways feeling like I've been poured out, God has done something within me in terms of empathy. He's grown empathy and understanding within me for this community. Now, I'm not trying to say that I've, I've got suffering down and um, I really understand it all now, but I certainly understand much more of what it means to feel like a jar of clay, vulnerable and fragile. 
perplexed, struck down. I understand a little bit of what that feels like. And I certainly get the fact that this is supposed to be a normal part of the Christian life. I want to encourage you with that today. If you today are thinking that you're really struggling and suffering, then know this, you are in very good company. The Apostle Paul, the super apostle, whoever we want to think of him, he felt rough. He really struggled in his life. Just one more thing to think about today is this. The Apostle Paul was willing to share his life. He was willing, willing to share his life with other people. Just one small phrase, probably one of my favorite phrases in the New Testament, or one of the phrases that has meant the most to me in the whole New Testament, is something that Paul writes to the believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. He says this to them, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives, our lives as well. For Paul, ministry was never nine to five. It was never something that he just went to a town, preached the gospel, and went to his nice Airbnb at night. It involved deep sharing of life with those that he ministered to. Now, this is hard for us to understand today, because we live in a society now with small individual family units. We live in these houses that have locks on them. We have gates at the front, just in case anyone gets in there. We have our own private spaces. This was very much not like the context that the Apostle Paul was in. We've probably got used to not fully sharing our lives with people anymore, especially not with those who are vulnerable and struggling. Sometimes we'll share the gospel with people, but we're not willing to share our very lives. Now, a bit more testimony from myself. One of my passions is incarnational ministry. Ministry that is based upon this idea that Jesus Christ, as it says in John chapter 1 in the message, Jesus Christ became flesh and blood and moved into the community. He became flesh and blood and moved into our community, our humanity. And that has always been my passion. So when I got the job in Parkhead, one of the first things that my wife and I did was start looking for a house in the local area. And so we bought a house um, that sits right about five minutes walk from our, one of our churches, our kind of main church in Parkhead, Nazarene, another kind of two minute walk from an old pub that we bought and have turned into a, a church plant that's called the Charter. So we sit right there in the very middle. When we walk out to go to the shops or out in the street, then instantly we are caught up in Parkhead life. Sometimes the chaos of Parkhead life. I've had to tell my kids sometimes about the realities of things that go on around about them. As they're getting older, even this other day, we're walking through the park and we met someone who was really in a bad way with drugs. And as they're getting older, my, my daughters are now nine and seven. They're starting to ask questions like, what's wrong with that person? And I find myself having to explain, well, here's a little bit of how that person's life has been. It can be chaotic. It can be challenging. But for us, this is the only thing we would do. We, we recognized early on that for me, in working in the church in Parkhead, ministry could very easily be a kind of nine to five thing. Sharing the gospel with people, but not been willing to share our very lives. And it is messy sometimes when you share your lives, when you have folks turn up at your door full of it, which has happened on a regular basis. People turning up in your garden wanting you to sort something out that's happened in the street. It can be chaotic, but it is incredible. And the fruit that we have seen from this kind of ministry, not just us doing it, lots of our friends have come and joined us and moving into the local community as well. The fruit that we have seen has been, again, unbelievable. Many, many people have come to know God because what happens is you, every time you're walking down the street, you're bumping into these same people. 
and your relationships with them become accelerated. So relationships that otherwise, if you lived in a different community, might take years and years and years to build, you build up over the space of a few months because you're meeting them in the shop, you're meeting them in the doctor's surgery, you're meeting these people in the school run in the morning. You're sharing life with them. And for us, one of the things that's been really important is to, you know, in our church, to make sure we have these people in our homes as well. To open our home, for a long time, we did a kind of weekly meal, a kind of table fellowship type meal where we just opened the the doors of our house and we would have um, 15, 20 people from the local community just sitting, eating out bowls. We didn't have enough chairs. The house is quite small. Um, It's an ex-council house that we bought. And we had all these people sitting there in chairs, eating meals, because we wanted to share our very lives with people. I don't say this at all to shame us if we live in nice areas or if we don't ever encounter people that are struggling or deprived, but rather to encourage you today to think about how you, either individually or corporately as a church, can share your lives with the community around about you. Whether that's your community here, I don't know much about your community here, or whether that's the individual community that you live in, or whether that's your work community as well. How do we share not just the gospel, but our very lives? It is costly, it is sacrificial, but the kingdom reward is worth it. Just in bringing things to a close this morning, as I was thinking about this, this theme of being poured out, it strikes me that in churches, as Christians, we, we speak a lot more of being filled up than poured out. We pray for, for deeper filling of the Holy Spirit, that we'd be filled up. We'll often as well, you know, come to a Sunday morning and we, one of the other words that we we'll use is that we want to be fed in the Word. We want to people who are well fed. I'm sure that's something when you think about a new pastor, you'll be looking for someone who will feed you through the Word. Now, these things are absolutely right and good. It is good to be filled up. It's good to be fed from the Word. But I wonder if sometimes we can become at risk of becoming spiritually fat, spiritually overweight, because we only consume rather than seek to pour out what it is that we are being filled with. You know, in in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we see that Jesus emptied himself Philippians chapter 2 talks about this. Kenosis is the the fancy Greek word for it. He emptied himself and he became just like us. And of course, on the cross, we see the ultimate in pouring out, the ultimate in emptying himself. Isaiah 53 states that he poured out his life unto death. And so I want to ask us today, are there ways that we individually, corporately, can begin to pour ourselves out for Jesus Christ, just like the Apostle Paul did. Maybe for some of us that's been willing to pour out and to let go our status or our reputation for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe it means having a conversation with someone who before you've been embarrassed to talk to about your faith. Maybe for some of us, it's a period, see, been able to see a period of difficulty or poor health or struggle as actually part of our journey of discipleship. And rather than ask God that he would take it away, asking God what he might be accomplishing in our lives through that. Perhaps for others of us, there's a challenge to think about our community. What is your community? How can you be someone who doesn't just long to share the gospel, although we always long to share the gospel, but how can we be people who share our very lives with people so that we have more chances to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, we're going to spend a moment in prayer just now before we come to the table. I want to say, if you would like to to pray this morning, if you'd like to receive prayer, then please, in the songs that we sing after communion a bit later on, please feel free to come to the front. There'll be a 
our prayer team, but also I'll be happy to pray with anyone. If any of these things have, have struck you this morning, then please don't just, it's easy to walk out of church, isn't it, and let things just sail over us and continue in the exact same way, but let's let God speak to us. Let us be a people who are willing to take up our cross daily, dying to ourselves so that we might completely live for him. Let's pray. Lord, as we just now come to approach the table, the Lord's Supper, I'll be reflecting the fact that on the cross, Jesus Christ, you were poured out for us. Lord, we are sorry for the ways that we can opt for easy discipleship. Sorry for the ways that we can pursue being filled up, only filled up. And Lord, we ask that you would show us how we can pour ourselves out as an offering to you. Show us how we can die to ourselves daily. Show us how we can take up our cross to follow you. And Lord, we know these things are not easy. So we ask that by your Holy Spirit living inside every single one of us, you would help us to do these things. In Jesus' name, amen.